Okay, let's get started. Um, again, we're waiting for some more people to log on, but I will record the presentation as well. Um, so I can always send that to um, anybody that missed it afterwards. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Lombardo. Um, I work in the marketing department here at Rothman Orthopedics. Um, I hope everybody is continuing to stay safe. I want to thank Senior Source for your help with promoting Dr. Seidenstein's lecture this evening. Uh, we normally do hold these lectures in person. Obviously, under the circumstances, we haven't been doing much of that, uh, but we have been doing a lot of virtual lectures, and the people have been finding the information very informative, so I hope you do the same. Um, our lecture today will be given by Dr. Ari Sadenstein. Dr. Sadenstein is well known throughout North Jersey and New York as a hip and knee replacement specialist with expertise in both primary and revision surgery. He has over 10 years of experience treating the most difficult problems in these joints and remains committed to improving patients' outcomes. He practices out of our Bergen County locations in Montvale and Rutherford. Um, his topic he will be speaking on today is ABCs of joint replacement surgery. Um, just a reminder, if everybody could just keep your phone on mute during the whole presentation, um, just to avoid any interruption. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to type, type them in the, in the chat section at the bottom of the screen. Um, and then Dr. Seidenstein will get to them either throughout the lecture or at the end. Um, or you can feel free to unmute yourself at the end and ask that um, the question out loud. All right, Dr. Seidenstein, are you ready to go? Yeah, thank you, Jen. Absolutely. Okay, well, again, thank you everybody for, uh, for I'll say, coming today um, in, the, in these crazy times. Um, I hope everybody and their families are, are healthy and, and doing well and are staying safe. Um, so today's topic, what we'll be talking about, is what I've titled the ABCs of hip and knee replacement. And I'm really just going to take you through the, uh, the generalities of, uh, of, of, of why we do the surgery, what happens uh, around the time of surgery, how to get ready for it, and what to expect. Um, again, if you do have any questions at all, feel free to either type them into the chat and I'll either answer them uh, as I see them or we'll, we'll talk about them uh, towards the end of this the discussion. Uh, uh, or at the end of the discussion, you can unmute yourselves and we will answer uh, as many questions as we can. Okay, so let's proceed then. How did I get here? Um, why, 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 why joint replacement surgery? Uh, what, what, what symptoms, what lifestyle changes, what quality of life changes have gotten me to this point? And so the majority uh, of the time, the reasons why we're doing hip and knee replacement surgery is for arthritis, uh, most commonly osteoarthritis, which is uh, the general wear and tear of the joint. It's a degenerative process. It's not something that happens over a day, a week, a month, but it happens over, over several years. Um, this uh, is only one type of arthritis. There are other types that, that can cause uh, joint damage that would, would lead one to be a candidate for joint replacement surgery, things like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and so forth. Um, this is diagnosed via symptoms, via uh, what's, what's been going on in your life and what you're telling your physician, the physical exam that's done uh, at the time of your visit, as well as during x-rays. Um, you can see on the bottom of your screen here, um, and both, uh, there's both a, an x-ray of the knee on the left and a hip on the right. Um, what, we're, what we're generally looking at, the most important thing is the space we see in the joints. X-rays only look at bones, and so what you see at joints are these spaces in between bones, which aren't truly spaces, but it's what the x-ray can't see, and what the x-ray can't see in these spaces is, is the amount of cartilage you have left in your joints. And so on the left side of both the knee and the hip x-rays, you see normal joints with nice big joint spaces in between the bones of those joints. And on the right-hand side, you're seeing the narrowing of the joints. There's really no space left in certain parts of the joints. There are bone spurs and so forth. Um, again, other types of reasons why you can end up with a hip or a knee replacement. There are certain types of fractures that could lead to this. There's, uh, there's a certain other conditions called avascular necrosis, which is um, some dying of the bone, but generally the reason why most of our patients are coming in is again for arthritis. So what are the symptoms that our patients typically have? Let me just move this chat box out of the way here. Um, so uh, they really are all over the board and, and, and a lot of people have all or some combination of some of these symptoms, which include pain, stiffness, potentially difficulty sleeping, whether it's falling asleep or waking up in the middle of the night. Um, the, the symptom that is the most specific 
atypic to arthritis is something we call startup pain or stiffness. Uh, and it happens when you're in one position for a particularly long time. And then when you try to get up and start moving again, your, your knee, your hip is initially just very stiff or painful at first. But as you get moving, it eases up a little bit, doesn't necessarily become perfect, but is better than what it was when you first started. Um, also, if you're unable to perform the activities of daily living that you normally like to do, um, that's commonly seen. Uh, patients with knee arthritis will have difficulty going up and down stairs. Patients with hip arthritis will potentially have problems putting on shoes and socks or have a hard time getting in and out of a car. And then also the need for an assistive device. If, if the pain or stiffness becomes so bad that it requires a cane or walker or even a wheelchair to get around. Um, and so what are the prior treatments you may have had prior to deciding upon having a joint replacement surgery? Uh, prior to even coming, you were probably modifying the way you were doing certain activities. You may have tried physical therapy or taken either over-the-counter or prescription strength anti-inflammatories. Uh, there are certain types of braces we can give patients, particularly for knee arthritis, that may make people a little bit more comfortable for a period of time. There are different types of injections. Uh, steroid injections, which work on the inflammation aspects of arthritis, um, and then also gel injections, uh, the medical jargon for which is called visco supplementation, which works more on the mechanical properties of arthritis. Um, and then there's arthroscopic surgery, which in general doesn't work very well for arthritis. It, it's rare that I would ever recommend somebody undergo that for the diagnosis of arthritis. But all of these treatments are really temporizing measures, meaning that they, they, they treat the symptoms but don't really cure you of the disease. Um, and they can do so for, for variable periods of time, sometimes days, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, and sometimes years. Um, eventually, what usually ends up happening, though, is that as time goes on, people's arthritis gets worse, um, and uh, these, these treatments tend to work not as well um, as time goes on, and your good days become uh, less good and less frequent, and vice versa. And so how do these things, how, do, how, do, how does hip and knee arthritis or hip and knee issues that would lead to joint replacement affect your quality of life? Uh, it could affect your ability to work depending on what you do for a living. It may affect your ability to participate in your normal recreation activities, the things you enjoy doing. Uh, it can affect your ability to, to, to take care of your hygiene uh, and, and perhaps uh, clean yourself in certain places and so, and so forth, uh, and, and as well as grooming. It may affect your ability to go out and socialize with friends and family. Hello? I'm sorry, I can't really hear you very well. Okay, I'm gonna continue for now. Um, it, it can affect your ability to drive. Uh, it can affect your ability to, to uh, practice your religion. Um, whether it be because of kneeling, um, uh, when you're praying, and so forth. Uh, it could affect your ability to care for others you normally care for. You may be somebody else's caretaker and not able to take care of them because you really aren't taking care of yourself. And it can ultimately affect your independence. You may rely on others to help you out because you can't do all these things uh, because of the, how it affects your quality of life. So let me move this out of the way again. What is a knee replacement? Um, so we call it a knee replacement, but oh, let me go back here. But in actuality, it's actually a knee resurfacing. And you'll see what I mean when I start talking about hip replacement surgery. And when I say resurfacing, meaning that we're not replacing the entire knee, but we're replacing the, the ends of the bone, where the cartilage is. Um, generally, uh, depending on the type of knee replacement you're having, um, it, it, it is anywhere from uh, two to four pieces. Um, the portions that are generally uh, put into the bone are uh, cobalt chrome or titanium, and the piece in between that replaces the cartilage. So, so we're going to do. I, I can't hear you, but we. If you would like to to ask your question, you can put it into the chat box. I will try to also elicit uh, questions uh, via phone at the end of the presentation as well. I'm sorry, just a reminder, if everybody could just also just keep their phone on mute um, as well. Um, I allowed everybody to unmute themselves if they want to ask a question at the end, but just keep your phone on mute, please, during the presentation. Okay, so uh, thank you, Jen. Um, 
These pieces can be either fixed to the bone, either through cement lists or uh, fixation or with cement. Um, with knee replacements, uh, there are partial and total knee replacements, depending on how much of your joint is actually affected. And on average, a full joint replacement will, will last you about 20 years. Which brings us to hip replacement surgery, which, is, which really is a real replacement of the actual bone here. You can see here, not only are you replacing the surfaces of the bones, but you're actually replacing a good portion of the bone as well. Um, uh, hip replacements are generally four parts as well. Um, the parts that go into the bone are made of titanium, a titanium alloy, and then generally the, the ball that goes onto the stem that goes into your bone is, more, is, is usually a ceramic uh, ball. And the, the liner that goes into the metal socket that we put into your, into your, your native hip socket um, is titanium as well. And into there goes, uh, the liner is a piece of plastic called polyethylene. Um, more often than not, these are fixed without cement. Uh, and people with really osteoporotic bone, a really soft bone, we may consider cemented fixation. And on average, a hip replacement will last you uh, about 25 years. So we need to remember, um, these are elective operations. Uh, I tell my patients all the time, I joke about it, but it's true, nobody's ever died of arthritis before. Um, no one should ever tell you this is a surgery you need to have. It should be a surgery you want to have. And everybody wants it at a different point in time. Um, it, it's my job to tell you if it's a reasonable treatment to consider, but it's your job to decide if you, if you want it. Um, I, tr I firmly believe that uh, the patient will not have the best result they could possibly have if they don't decide to have the operation. Um, this way, we're both invested, you know what to expect, you're motivated to do your recovery and so forth. Uh, again, it's ultimately the patient's decision. It's based on previous treatments that you may have had up to that point in time. It's based off your perception of quality of life, and that means something different to everybody because everybody enjoys different things in life and and everybody's hip or knee pain affects those things differently. And everybody's right because it's your perception of how it affects your life. And the decision is not only about if you want the surgery, but also about when, meaning that um, I'll tell my patients this also, I do the same surgery tomorrow that I do five years from now, meaning that my job never truly changes that much. The only thing I can't predict is, uh, and have a crystal ball to tell you about is, is how people's health will affect if and when they can have the surgery, but otherwise it's truly about when you are ready. Okay, so how do you go about finding the right doctor? Um, you obviously wanna look at, at their training. Um, these days it, it would really be uh, smart of the patient more often than not to find a doctor who's been fellowship trained in joint replacement surgery and adult reconstruction. Um, you want the doctor to be experienced. You wanna know that they do a lot of these and that they know what they're doing. Um, you wanna know that doctor goes to a hospital that has good outcomes. You wanna feel comfortable with your doctor. This is somebody that you are going to have a relationship with. The, 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 the relationship does not end after the surgery is over. This is somebody that you're going to be following up with uh, for quite some time after the surgery, even after the acute phase of recovery. And you also wanna know, does the doctor accept my insurance? Is, is this something that is not going to uh, cost me a lot financially. Okay, so am, am I a candidate? Well, we, also, we already talked about what makes you a surgical candidate and if you decide you're a candidate, but there's some other medical things to consider as well. For instance, if you're a diabetic, there's a certain lab called a hemoglobin A1C and you want that number to be under eight. If it is above eight, there are increased risks of wound complications and infection. Um, and you also have to think about your weight as well. We use a certain uh, n uh, number, a certain calculation called body mass index. And we want that number to be under 40. Um, if it is over 40, we ask you to lose that weight before the operation, or at least try your best to do so, whether it's through a nutritionist or surgical considerations. Because again, if you are above this number, um, all potential risks and complications, the chance of them happening goes up about eightfold. We ask that you try to smoke, try to stop smoking four to eight weeks prior to the operation, again, for uh, wound, potential wound complications as well as potential infection. Um, we do not do surgery within three months of any type of uh, joint injection. If you get a cortisone shot or a gel shot into your hip or knee 
prior to surgery. You have to wait at least three months after that until you have your operation because there, again, is increased risk of infection if you do otherwise. And then lastly, you want patients to try and discontinue all narcotics possible prior to the operation. And this has to do with the fact of pain management postoperatively. Patients who are taking narcotics before surgery uh, have a, uh, a lower pain tolerance after surgery. We, have, we, we can have a harder time controlling your, your pain from that standpoint. We will get pain management specialists involved if we have to, um, but we'd really try to get patients off narcotics prior to the operation if possible. Uh, not only from that standpoint, but narcotics also, and for unbeknownst reasons, but this is in our medical literature, it does increase risks uh, that, uh, across the board uh, for, for all potential complications of joint replacement surgery. Okay, so now what? Um, what do we have to do uh, to, to, get, to get ourselves to the date of surgery? Well, first we have to pick a date. We have to see what works for us from, from a, a work and family perspective. Uh, you have to see your primary care doctor and get cleared for the operation. Make sure your health is as optimized as possible, uh, as well as clearance from other specialists you potentially see. And again, coordinate this with family or friends because uh, you, you may need help um, as far as getting through the acute phase of recovery and may uh, elicit the help and time of, of some loved ones. What can I expect as far as the operation is concerned? We generally do all these operations under IV sedation and a spinal anesthetic. Uh, while you're getting the spinal anesthetic, you are sleeping through the medication you get through the IV. You're also sleeping through IV sedation during the operation itself. You're numb from the waist down. You will not feel anything. You'll be taking a nap. Um, you will be breathing on your own No, You will not be intubated. Uh, additionally, for knee replacements, we will give you a nerve block um, to the nerves that run down to the knee. Um, as well, and that, that is given uh, generally with a long-lasting anesthetic. Uh, all incisions are minimally invasive. We do this surgery through the safest possible, uh, smallest incision we can do. Uh, generally, uh, a, a hip replacement takes between 30 and 45 minutes, uh, and a knee replacement somewhere between 45 and 60. You are ambulating the same day with physical therapy, putting all your weight on the leg. Um, and then, depending on the patient under surgery, the patient may be discharged the same day or stay in the hospital for a day or two. And that's dictated by the patient's health, the patient's motivation, as well as the patient's home situation. Okay, so now that that's over with, uh, what do we expect after surgery? Our goal is to get all of our patients uh, home, um, to do either home or outpatient physical therapy. Um, uh, and that was true even before COVID. Patients just tend to do better and have less complications going home. But even, especially in this time of, of, of the pandemic, um, we're really trying to get as many patients as home as, as humanly possible, um, simply because uh, some of the, the sickest patients from the coronavirus and some of the worst uh, outcomes from the coronavirus have been happening at these long-term care facilities. Um, we discharge the patients from the hospital with the same pain medication that is controlling your, your, your pain in the hospital. So, um, you, can, you can feel safe, uh, comfortable in the fact that your pain will be controlled at home. You will be getting prophylactic medication for blood clots as well. That is one of the potential risks of this surgery, but when taking the medication, it decreases the risk um, uh, considerably. Um, uh, the, the chance of having a, a blood clot uh, becomes very small. Most patients will be prophylaxed with a baby aspirin. If patients have histories of blood clots in the past or other conditions, it could be uh, a stronger anticoagulant. Um, your first po post-operative visit will be approximately two weeks after surgery uh, for wound care and your first set of x-rays and to see generally how you're doing. So with hip replacement surgery, you'll be ambulating in the hospital generally with a walker. Uh, by the time you come in for your, your first post-operative visit at that two-week visit, most patients I'd say on average are using just a cane. Um, every once in a while, we will have an all-star who's walking without anything or bringing the cane in as a prop just to show off, but generally, uh, generally a cane at your two-week visit. And usually you're ambulating without assistance somewhere between two and six weeks on average. Uh, you're doing physical therapy for approximately two to three months after the operation. And you can shower after five days. We close our hip incisions uh, with glue and tape. And so um, it's really proof of concept. If, you, if there's no liquid coming out of the incision after five days, then uh, it's safe enough for you to go ahead and shower. You just can't swim or bathe and submerge the hip underwater. 
Okay, and now knee replacement surgery. So knee replacement surgery, the recovery is a little bit tougher. The first two to three weeks are the toughest. I generally tell my patients, you may not like me as much for those first two, three weeks, but after you get over that theoretical two to three week hump, you are gonna start to like me again. Um, the first six to eight weeks are the most critical with knee replacement surgery. You are, for those first to six to eight weeks, you're trying to get back all the range of motion in your knee as possible, bending as much as possible and straightening that knee as much as possible. What happens after eight weeks is that the scar tissue inside your knee will become so strong it won't allow you to get more motion after that period of time. So we really are emphasizing the importance of those first six to eight weeks to our patients. And so the, what I tell my patients is the best result from this operation really depends on two things. First, obviously, how good of a job I do during the surgery, but also how hard you work with your physical therapist to get that motion back. Generally, my patients are ambulating without assistance somewhere between three and six weeks after the surgery. And again, you're doing physical therapy for about three months afterwards. Uh, and with knees, you cannot get the incision wet for the first two weeks after the operation. Okay, so some frequently asked questions that I get from my patients. When can I drive? Well, that depends on the side that was operated on as well as the type of car being driven, meaning that if it's your left, if it's your left leg, you can drive as soon as you feel comfortable getting into a car, as long as it's an automatic, and obviously you're not on narcotics. Um, if it is your right side, though, generally you're not driving for about a week and a half to two weeks. When can I fly? Um, we recommend not flying for approximately six weeks, and this has really to do with the risk of blood clots. Um, remember, blood clots is a risk of these operations, and this risk goes up when you do get an airplane or are flying and are sitting for long periods of time. When can I return to work? Well, there are multiple factors that dictate when a patient can return to their job. Um, one is the job requirements, meaning that somebody who works in construction, obviously it might take them a little bit longer to get back to work than say somebody who's, who sits at a desk job. Uh, it depends on the uh, type of the, on the surgery performed. Uh, again, patients with hips are usually getting back to work uh, earlier than patients with knees. Um, again, every once in a while we have the all-star even with knees who get back within a week or two, but, um, but everybody's different in, in regards to how they respond to their surgeries. And then also your motivation to get back to work. Depends how quickly you'd like to get back to work as well. But all these things together do dictate when you're able to return. As well as the first question, when can I drive with the patients who do have to drive to get to their job and don't have help to, uh, with transportation? Um, again, those patients who are getting their, their left side done have an easier time getting to work than the patients with their right side, at least in the first uh, two weeks or so. Okay, so life after joint replacement surgery, what can we expect? So uh, again, like I said, this, this relationship doesn't stop after surgery. Um, I generally have my patients see me at two weeks. Uh, sometimes six weeks at three months and then at a yearly visit. And then after that yearly visit, I'm generally seeing you every two years or so just to make sure you're doing okay um, and, and, and take x-rays and make sure that everything looks okay as well. Um, uh, for those of you who know people who have had joint placements in the past, they probably have mentioned to you taking antibiotics for dental appointments in the past. But this has changed recently. Our literature now shows that Unless you're immunocompromised, you do not need to take antibiotics before your appointment with your dentist uh, to help prevent infection. It's really for only those who, have, uh, who are immunocompromised, uh, whether you're a diabetic have, or have some other type of uh, condition um, uh, that, that makes you immunocompromised. And then really, you're starting to live your life again. Uh, you're getting back to the things you enjoyed doing uh, prior to your quality of life being affected in the way it was, whether it's spending time with loved ones, um, uh, or whether it's doing the, the recreational activities you enjoy doing. Okay, so I will open it up for questions now if there are any out there from, from the people listening. Thank you, Dr. Seidenstein. Again, um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to type it into the chat section at the bottom, um, or you can unmute yourself and ask it out loud. I was um, scheduled for a knee replacement and it was canceled 
because of COVID. And I understand Jefferson still has a lot of COVID patients. And um, I'm just wondering when it's going to be possible to go back in there. Well, I, I can't speak to Jefferson specifically because I'm in North Jersey, so I can't tell you the situation there. But my understanding is, is that they are doing surgery there. Um, uh, up here in North Jersey, where I am, at Hackensack University Medical Center and Holy Name Medical Center, we started doing surgeries just after Memorial Day. Um, things are different in the sense of what um, uh, our protocols beforehand. Every patient has to have a negative COVID test within three days of the operation. Um, uh, so, so that, that is changed. You'll also note that uh, hospitals are different now too. Uh, the, the high number of patients, we, we, at least in North Jersey, at the peak of the pandemic when things were closed down, there were several hundred patients at a time in the hospitals with coronavirus. And now I believe in, in Holy Name Medical Center, there might be two patients with coronavirus. And I think in Hackensack, maybe seven. And these people are in completely different buildings. They're nowhere near the elective patients. They're nowhere near the surgical floors. Um, uh, all staff are, are wearing masks and goggles um, and, and appropriate PPE. Um, I, I truly do believe it's as safe as possible to have an operation right now. I'm not saying there is no risk, um, but even uh, to, to kind of put um, my... Uh, uh, to, to, to prove that to yourself as far as my, my aspect of it, even myself, I had a small arthroscopic procedure on myself a couple of months ago um, and, and, and everything went as smoothly as possible. And then we've been operating um, for these last several months, couple of months and uh, without incident, uh, thank God. Thank you. Just to add to Dr. Seidenstein's comments, um, if you'd like also, you can email me. I obviously send out the links. So you have my email address your personal information, um, and I can look into it a little bit. Um, I, I know we are reaching out to patients that were backlogged for surgery over the past couple of months, um, so I can look into the status of it for you. So if you just want to reach out, if, reach out to me after this, I can, I can help with that. Uh, so I'll, I'll answer uh, the question from JSIM. Um, uh, I'll just read it out loud. My mother had a hip replacement and they shattered her femur. I am worried about this. Do I need a bone density test to indicate if I might have the same complication? Um, my answer to that is no, you do not. Um, I will tell you that when I do a hip replacement surgery, um, uh, again, everybody's different as far as what type of prosthesis is used and required. Um, but when I'm preparing the femur for whatever prosthesis I'm using, I do get a sense as to how soft the bone potentially is. If there is, I will actually myself put a metal cable around the bone before I put my prosthesis in or, or, or prepare for it so that I'm protecting the bone from that type of thing happening. Um, I will move to now Dave. Uh, any reason they would use nylon stitches for internal stitches? I have several stitches coming up nine months after surgery. They did not dissolve. Um, I can't speak to what other doctors do. Um, I can just tell you um, I use under the skin dissolvable sutures for all my sutures. Um, so that generally is not an issue. Um, uh, and then for my hips, as I said, I do use glue and tape for to close the skin. For the knees, I still use new staples um, simply because there is more tension on that area, particularly when you're bending the knee during physical therapy, which is obviously is one of the goals. And so I just want to protect the wound itself. Um, but everything internal is dissolvable. Uh, Lucille Cunningham, I think that was more of a, was that more of a statement than an actual question there? Um, and then I think that's just another repeat uh, question from Dave. Anybody else have any other questions they want to uh, unmute yourself and ask out loud? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Well, here we go. Here's one more um, from JSM again. After two weeks, is it reasonable for a social worker to return to work? 
Um, again, I think it depends on, on what, what side you're having operated on. Um, uh, if you, if, and I'm assuming it's a hip since that's what your mother had. It's your right side. Okay. So if it's your right side, the answer is you probably won't be driving for about two weeks um, simply because um, your surgeon, if it was me at least, would not want you slamming on a brake in a parked car. God forbid you had to. Um, so if, if you can get to work um, uh, otherwise, I would say that, that, that yes. I mean, as a social worker, um, I'm assuming uh, there's not too much, act your husband can drive you, uh, that, that there's not too much physical activity. The answer is yes. I would tell your work it's a possibility that, that you could. Um, um, I, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. Um, and then Lucille coming in, I, I, I don't know, you're, so you're concerned about your high blood pressure. So that's really more of a, of a medical issue. I mean, as long as it's controlled and it's optimized by your medical doctor and they're saying you're fit for the operation, um, I, I, it, we generally, uh, unfort I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, however you want to look at it, the average age of somebody having a, a hip or knee replacement, although we do much older and much younger, is, uh, is early 60s. And a lot of patients in their 60s do have high blood pressure to some extent. And again, as long as it's optimized by your medical doctor and controlled with medication or exercise and diet, and they say that you are able to have the operation, it's, there's, there's no reason not to have that hold you back from getting the surgery. Okay, anybody else? Okay, well, if anybody else has any additional questions, feel free to email me directly. Um, I can work with Dr. Sadenstein on getting some of your questions answered. Um, for anybody that joined us late, um, as previously mentioned, Dr. Sadenstein is one of our joint replacement surgeons, sees patients out in Bergen County at our offices in Montvale and Rutherford. Um, I will send an email out tomorrow with a recording of this presentation um, in case you need to rewatch anything or forward along to anybody who may have missed it. Um, and it included also a scheduling contact information for Dr. Sidenstein and for Rothman um, for any general questions as well. Um, but again, I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Sidenstein, for the lecture this evening. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I hope everybody continues to stay safe out there. Yes, again, thank you, everybody. Thank you for, for listening. And uh, uh, same, same sentiments. Hope everybody stays safe out there and be well. Thank you. Yep.